I'm not a salesperson. I'm usually somebody who sits at bay by myself and types little reports. So, <laughs> so premise, this is not meant to be, I'm not a salesperson for Blackstone. I'm not here to sell you on Blackstone. I'm here to sell you on oil analysis. And I want to tell you all the great things you can learn about your engine through oil analysis and how to make the most out of an oil analysis program. So I hope this is really casual. If you have questions that come up, please ask me. If I'm boring you to death, please let me know. I, like, I don't do this. I don't do presentations. I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a nerd at my desk all day. So this is unusual for me, but it's a real, real treat. So I appreciate you having me. Um, so, uh, but I will tell you about oil analysis through Blackstone because that's what I know. That's where I work. That's what I do. So I'll talk about Blackstone a lot, but the, the, the key point I want you to take away from here is whether you use Blackstone or not, I think oil analysis is a great program. I think it can tell you a lot about your engine. And so that's what that's what I really want to focus on today. Um, but since I am from Blackstone, they were founded in 1985 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I work from home. I live in Danville, Illinois. So I, um, I don't go to the office very much. All the data gets sent to me. I write reports and send them out. Um, we do oil analysis for aircraft and engines, but also we do oil analysis for sir, oil analysis for just about anything: cars, trucks, boats, industrial samples. Um, we do air compressors. We do um, off-highway equipment. So if it runs oil, we can test it. We do transmissions. We do gearboxes. We do differentials. Those sort of things. So we do all all sorts of different oil uh, applications. Uh, I would say aircraft is about maybe a third to a quarter of what we do. We in fact have a separate lab entirely where all the aircraft samples are run just because of the lead that shows up from under low lead will skew the numbers for some of the other, other results. So we have a separate lab entirely for, for aviation stuff. My role with the company, I'm a senior analyst. I've been there about 14 years this month, I think. I spend most of my day writing the reports. So if you've seen one of our reports, you've seen the comment section, that's what I do. I look at all the numbers and I try to make sense of them for you so you don't have to be a chemist to make sense of oil analysis. Um, I also spend my day answering questions. So if you get one of our reports and you have a question, why wasn't this element addressed or here's the problems I'm having, how does that translate to what you're seeing? I, I will take your calls on, on any report that I've written and answer them directly. Uh, which is one of the things I think is great about Blackstone is if you call with a technical question, you're going to get tapped right through from an analyst to answer that question for you. I am also on the side, though, I'm an instrument rated commercial pilot. I have about 400 hours to my name, and I'm currently working on my uh, flight instructor rating. <clears throat> and a couple years ago, I started a flying club. We bought a 172 with a Note 360. Uh, so I have experience doing oil analysis in my own airplane. Um, and I'll show you one of my reports later. They're a little fun because when we write reports for each other, we have a little fun with them. But I wanted to show you, you know, that I use, I use oil analysis too. Well, let's talk about uh, the functions of oil. We, we all know that oil lubricates, it cools aircraft engines. You know, they're air-cooled, so you've got a little bit of oil helping with that. It helps seal things uh, like the rings. And if you have a constant speed propeller, it will act as a hydraulic fluid, actually in the prop. But also, it provides information. After, after the oil has done all the things it already does, you're just throwing it away. So if you take that used oil and send us a sample, we can tell you a lot about what's been going on inside your engine that you might not know about otherwise. So, this, okay, this right here, this is the hardest slide I have all day. I can tell you how we can predict problems with oil analysis. So in oil analysis, the metal that's generated from wear is microscopic. The stuff that we read in analysis is microscopic parts per million, or microscopic metals in parts per million. So we are not looking at chunks, we're not looking at pieces, we're, looking, we're not looking at serial numbers, we're looking at stuff that you can't see with the naked eye. And the idea being, if you sample regularly, the amount the type and the balance of metal that shows up time after time after time will start to eventually change. And if, if you're doing oil analysis regularly, it will change in the oil analysis a lot of times before you see a change in your end, before you see compression start to drop, before you start to see metal in the oil filter, before you start to find metal in the screen. We see metal before that point. 
And if you're paying attention to how these metals are changing over time, the idea is that you can start to troubleshoot and correct it before it turns into something that's generating metals and then showing up in the soap. So that's the idea with oil analysis. A lot of times people will have a problem and then sample the oil and see what it looks like. And that's great, we can, we can diagnose problems that way too, but the real benefit of oil analysis is doing it before you have a problem so you can troubleshoot those things when they're small before they show up anywhere else. Um, let's see. The other thing that oil analysis can do is it can identify contaminants. So water is a, is a common one that we find either because you have an open breather that's subject to humidity from the atmosphere or because water combusts your byproduct. It's, it's going to be there. Um, is the oil getting hot enough to cook it out? That's one of the questions that we can help you answer. We can look for fuel dilution. If you have a cylinder that's not working properly, spark plug's not firing the right way, and that extra fuel is gonna go somewhere, it's gonna go past the rings, end up in the, in the oil. Uh, so we can find fuel dilution problems, and we can also work. And an example I wanna talk about is, let's say you have an air, you, do, you, you check the air filter with every pre, pre-flight inspection, right? It's, and my plane is right in front, it's there, I can see that there's no bugs or, you know, pieces or anything like that stuck to the front of it. But let's say your car P4 wants to close in properly. When do you check that? When do you check your ultimate air door? If you start to see an oil analysis silicon showing up time and time and time again with a little bit of cylinder wear, that's when we're going to say, hey, you've got an air intake leak somewhere. You've got some dirt getting in your engine. It's causing wear in the cylinder or the pistons. Start looking for that. Well, you check the obvious things first. You check the air filter, maybe you change it. Maybe you check for any leaks. You kind of check downstream of the air filter. You check each bank of cylinders to see if there's anything there. You, you watch your EGTs and your CHTs and your EGTs and you look for one side of the cylinder, you know, one side of the engine running hotter than the other or one cylinder running hotter. And you keep looking because we're still seeing it. So the idea being that you, you, you're, you, you become aware of problems that you didn't know you had so that you can fix them before they develop into problems that you know you have. Um, do you have any questions so far? Okay, I'm just going to keep rolling. I got one. Sure. <clears throat> Do you analyze, say you uh, take your oil filter apart and you find something in there. Mm -hmm. Will you analyze that material? Yeah, we do. And remind me, I'll show you one of my filter reports. I've got okay. one on my computer for you. Uh, I, I wondered if that would be a question. We do it a little bit differently. We don't do the alloy numbers that some of the labs will do, but we, we do it a little differently. So I'll show you that. Um, the other thing that's really great for oil analysis is it's good for pre-buy inspections. And that was one of the things I insisted on when we started our club. I did a, a, I overnighted an oil sample to the lab so that we'd have results the next day. That's a, an insider tip. If you're doing a pre-buy, if you need results right away, overnight that sample to us. It gets put in the run for that day. So you have results the day you receive it most of the time. Um, and it's a good selling point. We have, we have customers all the time that say, hey, I had 20 years of oil analysis done on my engine. You had 20 years of reports that said, hey, good job, keep up the great work, your engine looks great. And I just sold my high time engine, you know, at a pretty good price because I've had all this data to show me that it looks good, that it's been taken care of, that it's been, the oil changes have been done frequently. So it's a really good selling point for uh, selling in airplanes too. One of the other things that we can identify in oil analysis that doesn't necessarily show up anywhere else is corrosion. And that's one of the number one killers of aviation engines, heat and corrosion. Um, and corrosion doesn't really show up until you get cams falling or until you get, um, you, you did some cylinder uh, fitting and you start to see metal in the oil filter. We can see corrosion in the aluminum and the iron values well before you see anything on your end. Uh, so that's one of the things where, you know, it's my engine rusting from the inside out. We can, we can identify that and, and come, come up with a plan to either take preventative measures if you're not going to be able to fly enough or fly more or change the oil more frequently or do something to prevent that, the engine from rusting from the inside out. Life on the engines because of the overhead cam that's not bathed in oil is especially, they're especially susceptible to cam falling because of corrosion. If the oil falls off the cam and you have a pretty inactive engine, that's one of the big concerns with life on the engine. 
There are limits to oil analysis, though, and that's one of the things I want you to understand as well. We don't identify large pieces. So if there's anything in your oil that you can see, if the oil is glittery when you pour it out, if the oil has chunks that fall out with the oil, or the oil filter has pieces in it, that's, that's stuff that's too big for oil analysis. So it's happened many times where, you know, you write a great report, and somebody comes back and says, well, my filter was caked full of metal, how come you didn't see it? Well, we're looking at two different things. We're looking at the microscopic things, and a lot of times when there's the bigger pieces, there's also the microscopic pieces, but not always. It just depends on the nature of the problem. So that's one of the things I just remind everybody that if you're doing oil analysis, you should also be cutting this filter or inspecting the screen or both um, with every oil change, because you're looking at two totally different levels of metal and getting that full picture by doing both is really what you want to do. Um, we also don't see sudden failures due to fatigue. So if, if something just gives way, that we're not going to see it. You're, you're going to notice it on your end first. Um, we also, bearing problems are really hard to see in aviation oil samples just because the metals that are associated with bearing could be copper, lead, and tin. And lead, in aviation engines, you get lead blow by from the fuel. And you get thousands of parts per million of it. So any, you know, 30 parts per million of lead you're going to see from the bearings or whatever it's going to be totally masked by the thousands of parts per million parts per million of lead from the fuel. See, you see this coming this way? So that's the yellow wave. So that's one of the things. People will say, how are my bearings doing? And it's one of the things that we can't necessarily see. Um, we do look at the lead and the copper and the tin together, but lead is kind of the main metal there, so we, we have a hard time seeing lead. However, if you're running unleaded fuel, it's a totally different story. Um, so that's, that's one of the limits of, of the aviation oil. Um, a lot of times people have a question of when do I start an oil analysis? I've got a brand new engine. I don't want to start it during break-in. But I will say uh, break-in samples are a good time. If you've got a brand new engine or you're breaking in a cylinder, yes, there's going to be metal there. Yes, there's going to be silicon there for sealers and things. But the break-in process looks strikingly similar between so many different engines. Um, it has kind of a trademark look to it. And if you start sampling right away, when you've got that first sample that's full of metal, that's, that's the kind of the high water mark, and then you sample with each oil change and that stuff improves, you, you can watch it. You can watch it drop right out of your samples for the first 100 or 200 hours, depending on your engine and your oil change interval. Um, Whereas if you start, you know, you know, you say you start 50 hours in, you're starting kind of in the middle and, and maybe something's a little bit high, but maybe it's been improving, but you don't know it. And, and so it's kind of a more of a watch and see. I tell all my customers, I like to see the wear in sample. I like to see that high water mark and I like to see things improve. Um, and if you listen to Mike Bush, he has a pretty good spiel on infant mortality, um, where he talks about engines are most likely to fail within their first couple hundred hours, maybe due to maintenance errors or installing pistons incorrectly or upside down or the wrong pistons or whatever. Um, so if you start sampling right away, if there's something like that, or if the cylinder is glazed over, or if the rings are installed incorrectly, it's something that will show up in oil analysis if it's if it's wrong enough, even with all the wear and stuff there. So as I, I tell my customers if, if I, you know, as soon as we put on a new engine, I'm gonna sample it right away. Yeah. Is there a lower limit on hours for the oil change that could, you, you start to go, well, I can't tell much because it's only been 20 hours or 15, yeah, there is, 30 hours there or 25 is. hours or 10 hours? There is, and the challenge with a really, really short oil sample like that is you never get all of the old oil out of the engine. So you think you're starting with fresh and zeros all the way down, all the metals, but it, it doesn't happen that way because about 20% of the old oil stays in the engine when you change it. Even if you let it drain all night, even if you know you take a, you do everything you can, there's a bunch of oil still splashed around that engine. So you you never ever start with all zeros. And so yes, if you do a five hour oil change, maybe because you haven't flown much this year, yeah, it's going to be a little bit harder to see if there's any big problems. But there should still be the right balance of metals. They should still be balanced in the correct way. They should be proportionate to what you've seen before. So if you see the proportion of metals start to change, 
And then, you know, it might happen two years down the road that you have another five hour oil change because you didn't fly much this year. You still get that trend to compare to. So that is valuable data to compare to later. So I, yeah, I, I in fact, I'll tell you a story with our 172. Um, over the winter, we had reinstalled like an engine dehydrator to see, and I wanted to see if it was working. So I pulled a sample. I think we had just changed the oil. I think we had like an hour on the oil, but it had been sitting for a couple weeks. So I wanted to see if any water showed up. So I, we have a little pump. You can stick a tube down the dipstick and I just siphoned up some oil. Well, I, I, I decided at the end that I'm not going to send the sample. So I just set it on the shelf in the hangar. Wouldn't you know the very next flight, one of our students went up with a CFI and they had a low oil pressure incident. 8,000 miles, 8,000 uh, oh, okay. feet up, 10, 10 miles north of the airport. They came back, landed. Well, they did a go around because they thought it was a gauge problem and not, not an actual problem. So they did a go around and landed. And wouldn't you know, I had that five minute sample sitting on my shelf. And then I had the very, you know, the oil that was in the engine when they lost oil pressure. And I set those two for comparison to see how much metal was generated. So it, it turned out that that sample was invaluable. And then the very next sample we did, we, we, we cut the filter open. We did find some metal in the filter. Um, the very next day, so we followed Lyco Maintenance to Service Bulletin, oh, I can't remember the number, 480, I think, um, as, as far as what to do with metal in the oil filter. And the next thing was to do like a 30 minute ground run. So now I have three samples with like no hours on them to get a really nice comparison with, you know, that, that one five hour sample to how is our engine wearing now. So it happens sometimes like just out of chance that that short oil sample ends up being really useful because maybe you have a problem right after you change the oil that you can compare to. So I, I from then, I, you know, I don't hesitate to, to, to get more data. I, I, I think there's, Nothing wrong with having more data, even if it's a short interval and there's not, you know, not much metal. There's still something you can learn from it eventually. Um, good question. Yeah. What sure. was the cost? Sorry. What was the cost? What was the cost? No, cost. The cost. The cost. Oh, the cost. So you're not gonna believe this. Okay, so so we oh, can we save the story for later? We'll come back to it because I could talk about this forever. Yeah, go ahead. So you have like an established baseline for, yes. for the amount of hours on an engine and what metal you'll see in there? No, or no. Just, I'll, so if you start with like a thousand hour engine and start doing a oil analysis, will you see the same thing as you would? Basically, I know the engine tends to wear, as soon as you get all that wear and wash out, and it depends on the engine, like a six cylinder Continental usually takes around 200 hours worth of oil changes to to get all the wear and stuff out. Most engines take about 100 hours. It's not, you know, it's not, it depends on, you know, if you do 250 hour oil changes, it might take a little longer, but around 100 to 200 hours. But once you get past all that and all the wear and wash it out, as long as your engine's healthy, it should wear about the same until, until we get it time. Uh, so we don't have separate averages for like, oh, I have a young, you know, 200 hour life on the engine. How is that going to compare to the 1800 hour life, I mean, the average, they, they should wear the same pretty much through the entirety of their life, as long as they're healthy and there's nothing causing any trouble. Yeah. Could you talk about discipline in the sampling process? Sure, along, sure. Along with trend analysis that you utilize as part of all of this? Absolutely, good question. I'm, it's like I paid you to be here. So, my source is supposed to be that money. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the second part. Now, how about an engine that you put a lot of work through, like a radial engine? That That's a good question. That's one of the challenges. But here's where it trends come. So, so that's one of the things I do have on my, my slide for later is, is one of the challenges of oil analysis is uh, one of the ways to get the best out of your oil analysis is to give us as much information as possible. We'll talk about that. But one of the things is oil consumption. Sometimes, you know, a shop will send it and they don't tell us, and then the, the owner will send it next time and they'll say, oh, we're going to burn through 12 quarts of oil or whatever. And that's information to have because we look at that and we say, oh, this sample looks really good, but you also added twice as much oil as you normally did. So we have to take that into account when we say how great your engine looks. But with the radio, because they use so much oil every single time, those trends are still valuable because that, that variable is kind of negated. 
because it's it's still common. Unless, you know, you go through a whole bunch more oil than normal, but you still, yes, radial engines look really, really clean just because they, they go through so much oil, but you can still see variations in the trends and, and you still find problems that way. So how to take a sample? Um, there's two different ways, uh, and I have, to, I have plenty of these available, and, and I have all kinds of stuff on the table. Take what you want, but again, you don't have to take from my company. One of the things is just to catch an oil sample while the oil is draining. Uh, we like to tell people, oh, I should put that on the slide, should I? We like to tell people not to get the first oil out of the engine because if you, if you pull that plug out, any debris or dirt that's around the plug, if you catch that right away, you're going to catch that in your sample too. We also tell people not to get the last oil that's draining out. And the reason for that is just because we want as much oil in the bottle as you can. So if you run out of oil before you fill the bottle and you only have this much, we can only do a couple of tests on uh, the flashpoint test, I'll talk about the test, takes like half of the bottle. So if, you know, the more oil we have, the better. So try not to get the first oil out or the last oil out as it's draining. Or we have a pump, like I talked about with my 172, we have a pump that goes, the tube is like refrigerated tubing, just goes right down the dipstick and the pump attaches right to the, the bottle and you just fill up the bottle that way. And that's a really good option for random things like checking for water between oil changes. But also, um, one of my suggestions is to send us a sample a month before your annual so that when we come back with a list of things to check, you know to tell your AMP, hey, I'm supposed to, Blackstone wants me to horoscope and check compressions because my cylinder metals are going up. So that's, a, that's another way to sample. So take the sample either as it's draining or through a pump. Uh, it is, I have done, I've done extensive testing on my own airplane, does it make a difference if you pour it out of the filter? No, it doesn't. Does it make a difference if you catch, um, I, I, have, I have done an oil change where I sampled out of the dipstick, caught a sample midstream, and poured it out of the filter. And I tested all three of them, and it's a very minuscule difference between them. So it doesn't really matter, but just in case there's a slight difference, I just tell people to do it the same way every time. If it's easier for you to pour it out of the filter, then do it and do it that way every time. Yeah. Is there a limit to how long a sample can sit on the shelf before you send it in? Nope. So if you have, say, an aircraft owner that forgets to send it in for a couple months? Yeah, as long as it's sealed up, yeah. I mean, the metals aren't going to dissolve, okay. the seals aren't going to dissolve, it's still going to be there. We're going to shake up the sample really good, so anything that's falling on a suspension will make it into the testing, so it's not, it's not a problem at all. Um, the, the, the key, though, is just to take the sample the same way every time. Maybe there is a part for really a difference here and there between you sampling from the filter or the engine, but if you do it the same way, however it's easiest for you, we catch it midstream, but it, it doesn't make a huge difference. Does that answer your question? Does that, oh yeah, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, if you tie it into the trend analysis over a long period of time and the, the discipline of the sampling that ties into the, the uh, trend that you're looking for for each of the metals that you're finding, I think you'll find that's important to the process. If you're, if you're on a long-term analysis, process. Okay. I think I think you know what I'm talking about. I think so and I, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna cover that in a, in a bit. Maybe the next one. Ah no. Let's see. It, it's the trend analysis that oh, can be so helpful. Yeah so okay oh here we, here we go. Here's the page I'm looking for. Um, getting the most out of your oil analysis. Is sampling regularly for trends. That's that's the key. Is you look at the, these changes over time. And I have a lot of questions. Well, does that mean I have to sample every oil change? Does that mean I have to sample every annual? What does that mean for me? Uh, am I going to have to send you know 70 samples a year to you people because I fly a lot? Here's what I tell my customers. I say I want to see three oil changes in a row. I want, and, and that tells me so much. Number one, it tells me how consistently you're changing your oil. If you're one of those people that 25 hours in, bam, the oil's out, that tells me something. Um, if, if you're changing it based on hours and you're not flying much, if, if it took you all year to get 25 hours, I can, I can learn a lot just by looking at three consecutive samples. And a lot of times it takes three samples to get like a good trend. Sometimes, you know, metals are not gonna be perfectly stable from every oil 
change to the next, there's going to be a little ebb and flow. You're going to fly a little bit less in the winter, so you might see a little bit of corrosion metal, aluminum and iron, <coughs> be a little bit higher in the winter. Or you, you know, when you have a massive heat wave and you do a whole bunch of takeoff and landing because you're working on your commercial and you're really putting the power, you know, to the engine over and over and over again and you're seeing hot and cold cycles, there's going to be a little bit of change to the metal. And the key is whether they're going up and continuing to go up or whether they're going up and coming back down and going up and coming down. And so it takes three samples to get a feel for what's going up. If metals are going up and up and up or if they're kind of going up and, and ebbing and flowing a little bit. So that's, that's the number one thing, is sample regularly. Once you have those three samples, it's really, it varies from person to person. We see flight schools that fly 100 hours a month, and they will send two little samples to us every month, and you see sample after sample after sample. But then there's, there's people that fly, you know, five, 10 hours a year, and you see one sample a year from them. I just want to see, see people sample regularly. If that means every annual for you, if that means every other oil change for you, if that means every oil change, as long as you have a regular pattern, and that's, that's where the key comes in, is you can see changes over time. I like to sample every oil change, but I, I might be a little bit biased because I just send my samples to work, and I write my own reports, and I can see everything myself. So <laughs> I, sample, I sample my car every oil change, and I sample my airplane every oil change. <laughs> to do to get the most out of your oil analysis program is to fill out the oil slip completely and we'll talk about that but in each of our sample kits is a piece of paper like this front and back and there's some questions on here and the more information you can tell us the better you know. how much is the kit the kits are free they're it free 35 dollars to run the analysis okay so if there's questions on here you have about whether mm. you're at um, there's space to tell us a love story about what's been going on with your airplane. If you were down for avionics work for six months, we want to know that. If you've been flying, you know, a lot of instrument approaches where you're kind of relatively low power, kind of easing into an, on an approach, we want to know that kind of stuff because that stuff changes how your engine wears. And so the more information you can tell us about the, the cylinder types, um, the type of flying you've been doing, if you've been going to a grass strip because you want to work on your, your, you know, your soft field landings and you've been flying on grass a lot, we want to know that kind of stuff because it, it affects how things look. And the more you can tell us, the better. Um, so give us those, uh, fill out these information slips completely and tell us the details. The other thing, ask questions. We are here for you. These reports are not any use to you at all. If you don't know what you're looking at or if you have a question that you leave unanswered, that's what we're here for. My card is on every one of these tables. You can ask me any question about any oil report at any time, even if you think it's the dumbest question in the world. I am happy to answer all the dumb questions because these are your reports and they're meant for you to understand them. So ask questions. Don't let a question go unanswered. If you're like, oh, why do you, do you, maybe did silicon go up because I had the valve covers replaced? I wonder. But don't wonder. Just email us and ask us and we'll let you know if that's likely or not. I've had some people ask if silicon would go up because they took their BMW through a car wash? The answer in that case was no, but I'm glad he asked anyway. Um, <laughs> the other thing is do share your reports with your AMP. When, you, when you're going in for an annual, give them the reports. They're welcome to call us with questions. They're welcome to, to say, hey, we're seeing this. this, this. They're, they're welcome to all your information. If you give us your AMP's email address, we will email him or her uh, your reports as well. Um, and then, like I said, before sampling, before your annual, if possible, so you have those results and you have your list of things from Blackstone to look into, or you know everything's good, so when your AMP's like, we want to do this, you'd be like, oh, we're good. Um, so that's the biggest thing. Uh, here's the oil slip I was talking about. Um, the more information you can give us, the better. So for example, cylinder types, maybe not everybody knows what kind of cylinders they have, Give us the brand. Give us the serial number. Tell us what color paint you have on it. Tell us what the little name on the end of the valve cover says. That information is extremely useful. Millennium cylinders are steel, but they traditionally cause high chrome readings. So if you don't know you have, if you just say I have millennium cylinders, oh, 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 go back, go back. Stop. Stop. <laughs> See, I don't do this very often, so I'm trying to figure out, oh, oh. No, go back. 
<laughs> this way. No. Am I going the right way? <laughs> yeah, here we go. So tell us what brand of cylinders you have. That's good information. Millennium cylinders, like I said, they're steel, but they cause high chrome readings in a lot of a lot of reports. Not everyone, but a lot. So if, if we're constantly saying, hey, do you have superior cylinders? Do you have millennium cylinders? Look that up and let us know. Call me back and say, yeah. You're right, I do have I do have superior cylinders, and I'm glad you mentioned it. And I'll say, great, now we know your chrome is always going to read high. And we can kind of figure that out when chrome reads high for three samples in a row, but now I don't have to say, hey, make sure you're checking compression, because I know it's going to be high. So give us that information. Um, as far as like filling out the engine, making my once you give us the tail number, filling out the serial number and everything is not necessarily as important. Um, so don't, don't feel like that's on the back here. The, the aircraft made the model serial number. Once you give us that the first time, as long as you give us the tail number, uh, that's good. The other thing I want to mention is whether you send a sample or your mechanic sends a sample, if they include your tail number, we're going to include the trends that we can we have. So if you send a sample and you do the oil change, you know, between annual and then he sends a sample at annual, we will pull all that history together so that it's not a separate set of trends here and a separate set of trends here. We, we understand the value of having those Unified trends, so we'll send us, we'll combine all the history whenever we whenever we get a sample and we check it by tail Um The question about inactive under sort of the middle bottom of the, the thing there, has the engine been inactive? People, I think, mark no to that because their definition of inactive is was it sitting down, unable to be flown for a number of months. Our definition of inactive is fewer than five hours of flying per month on average. That's the amount of flying it takes to keep corrosion out of an engine in normal circumstances. If you live in the desert, it's a little bit less. Uh, if you live in hot and humid Louisiana, it's going to take a little bit more. So it just depends on your climate. In fact, I had a customer just moved from, well, I guess he was a year ago or so. He moved from like Reno, Nevada or something to like South Carolina. And suddenly he was seeing a lot more aluminum and iron and we're like, this looks like corrosion, but you're not flying any less than you usually are. And he said, well, I just moved to South Carolina. Would that have anything to do with it? And, and yeah, that was the best we could come up with is the change in environment uh, affected that. Uh, so that's our definition of inactive. So, so sometimes, you know, it's kind of hard to, somebody will say, no, it hasn't been inactive, but then we can tell that they've only flown 20 hours the whole year. We have to kind of break it through like, Yes, this is technically inactive, and technically these metals could be showing a little bit of corrosion. Uh, so don't be shy about the inactive. You know, we can tell if you're sampling every oil change if you're active or not. Um, but that's a, that's a question that a lot of people don't understand. And then uh, again, there's a cylinder question on the back too, because that's an important thing to know. Um, we're going to talk about how our reports look in a second, and uh, I'll show you where that comes into play. Questions so far? Complaints. Yeah. Is it better to take the sample when it's warm or when it's cold? Yeah, generally when it's warm. If, if, you know, for, for our, what we do is we go out and do a couple of touch and goes, and then we come back, drain the oil, and we do a compression check right away when it's hot. Um, generally, it's hot. It's better. Um, part of the reason for that is any condensation that might have developed, you know, while you're sitting, while the engine was cooling off uh, from your last flight, any condensation should be cooked out. It's not essential. So if you if you absolutely can't go fly, it's an IFR day, and it's the only day you have for three months to change your oil. Just tell us was not able to fly beforehand, and we'll, if we do find a little water or fuel, we'll take that into consideration. It's best to fly, but it's not absolutely essential. So the other thing I want to mention with oil analysis is just one tool in your toolbox. It is a piece of data. Uh, it's a valuable piece of data, and there's things you can learn about from your about your engine from oil analysis alone. But it's only one tool, so so don't you know don't omit everything else you're already doing to do oil analysis. Keep checking the filter. Like I said, we're looking at two different sizes of metal, so that gives you the most complete picture when you're looking at both things. Continue doing regular compression checks and bore stroke checks, and noticing any oil consumption changes. Um, and engine monitor data is also invaluable. It tells you so many different things about your oil that, about your engine that oil analysis can. And the other thing that, uh, you know, as pilots, we know our machines, we know our engines, we know how they run, we know when our gut is telling us something is different. That's an invaluable tool too. So don't forget about the gut test and the stomach test. Uh, let's see, make sure.
sure I covered everything. So the next thing I want to talk about is I want to go through the anatomy of an oil report. And I want to use one of my reports for an example. So this is my latest report from R172. And again, with the comments, I'll let you read the comments, but know that I'm writing this as a joke to my, my playmates. You know, so it's a little funny. We have a little fun with each other. That's one of the perks of, of doing our job is when we write reports for each other, we can be a little bit goofy with it. Depending on our age, we probably may not be able to read that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, is, it, is it totally in focus? Oh, maybe. oh yeah, it's, it's, it's in focus. You might, want to, read need a bigger you might want to read it to us. All right, all right. So here's, here's the comment section. So, Amanda, were you sitting here wondering if flying in smoking conditions would cause silicon to rise? If you were, then wonder no more, it doesn't. At least not for our airplane. Silicon is of a mere one part per million, which is the difference between Randy cutting the cheese while changing the oil and him not. Or something equally benign if you consider something like that a benign occurrence. Silicon looks fine in the wear metals of a lagoon. And then I wrote to myself, I think there were probably three or four flights, maybe even more in smoking conditions, but we changed the air filter anyway. Uh, so that was one of the things we had talked about. There were a couple of flights. Uh, one guy went from Danville to St. Louis and back in some really, really smoky conditions over the summer. In fact, he had to file that far because it was that smoky. And we had debated whether, you know, whether this would cause any damage to the engine, whether it would cause the air filter to become dirty. Um, so we ended up changing the air filter early just, just in case. But that was one of the things we kind of looked at. So, okay, so the oil announcement support. The top part, I wonder if oh, the mouse will work. Maybe. Oh no, we may have to turn it off. So, uh, up at the top, this is the, the lab report number. Uh, so, each report gets its own number. So, if you are calling with a question, that's a really good number to give us because we can pull this report up right away. Also, the tail numbers up there, my client ID, and some, some details. Uh, then the second part there is the uh, engine specific stuff, so like my engine, the type of fuel I'm running, um, my serial number, that sort of stuff. If you had chrome cylinders, that would show there. If you had some sort of weird oil filtration set up, like you, you know, you're using a re reusable filter or you have a remote filter thing installed, that sort of stuff shows up there. Uh, anything that's peculiar to your engine, sometimes we'll write um, new cylinders added at 600 hours or something like that. And then the stuff on the right is specific to this particular oil change. So we did uh, Phillips XC 2050 and we ran 62 hours. And that's a little long, we have a lipo main, so 50 hours is the recommended. But because we have a really long history of oil analysis reports here, I knew I wasn't worried about those extra couple hours on the oil. Uh, I knew our engine could handle it, so I wasn't worried about it when we couldn't get the oil changed in time. So then the middle part of our report is uh, the, the wear metal. This is sort of the meat and potatoes of our report. On the left side, the left side here, you see all the different metals. Ooh, can't do this. All the different metals we test. So aluminum, chrome, iron, copper, lead, and tin. Those are the, some of the biggest wear metals. So aluminum, chrome, and iron usually come from pistons, rings, and steel parts. Uh, copper is from brass and bronze parts. Lead and tin usually bearings, bovine bearings. Uh, a lot of these elements in the middle here are additive, you'll see in gasoline or diesel engine oils that don't really show up in aviation oils. Uh, silicon is a possible site of dirt contamination. Um, and then phosphorus is an aviation additive. So sometimes you'll see it, uh, but the Phillips XC doesn't use it. So you can see we have basically not in our report. Um, so what we do is we, we do, uh, the, the most current report is the one on the left. And then we track the trend over time from, from newest to oldest. On the, all, all the way on the right side is universal averages. And those are based on the engine type that this sample is. So this is an 0360 A4M. Those are averages from that engine alone. Um, and then the unit location averages are averages from my engine only. So I can take this, this column here, and compare it to this one to see how my engine on average wears compared to all the other 0360 A4Ms. And as you can see, clearly I'm doing something right because all my numbers are lower than average. Yeah. Um, but this, the unit location averages are particularly helpful if you have chrome cylinders or nickel cylinders because most of these engines come with steel cylinders. So those averages are based on mostly engines with steel cylinders. So if you, you have you know, six chrome cylinders, you're going to have a little bit more chrome in your oil. So that's one of the reasons why we do those unit location averages 
so you can see how your chrome value or your, your current sample compares to your own averages. Uh, and what we do is, so to get these universal averages, we average all the healthy engines of that type. So every O360 A4M that's looked healthy without wearing, we put in this average file. So it's a growing file. It may change over time as, as engines change or whatever. Um, but they're meant to be current reflection of how this engine typically wears right now these days. Um, so that's not going to take into account wear in. It's not going to take into account, um, like I said, different kinds of cylinders. Then the bottom of the report, these are the physical properties. We also check the viscosity. And there's two lines for the viscosity. It's like just um, two ways of saying the same thing. Some people prefer one way, some people prefer the other. But these should be values in this gray column are based on whatever oil you told us you're using. So these are the typical ranges for a Phillips XC20W50. And so you can see if our readings fall in line. Uh, the next test we do is the flashpoint test. So basically locate the oil, we'll pour it into a hot cup or a Bunsen burner with a, um, a pilot light over the top and a temperature gauge in it. And we'll measure the temperature when the, the vapors over the oil ignite. And every oil starts with a should be value, in this case it's greater than 430. If the, the, if the flash point is lower than that, it means something is present that's causing the oil to flash earlier. And usually that something is fuel. So we assume it's fuel and we calculate accordingly. But let's say you just did a ring flush because you had high oil consumption and you wanted to, you thought maybe you had a stuck ring or something or a ring that was gummed up. Solvents like that will show up too and it'll just kind of look like fuel because it'll lower the flash point the same way. So that's another case where if you have something like that done, let us know. We can say, hey, you just did a flush on your engine. That's probably why this is low. Um, we also check for water. And uh, in liquid cooled engines, we will check for antifreeze as well. And insolubles are basically solids that form in your oil as the oil is exposed to heat and use. We'll measure those as well. They can be a sign of like excessive heat. They can be a sign of blow by. Uh, with aircraft engines, a lot of times, a lot of times with just normal combustion, those solids will be black. But with aircraft samples, they're actually like a, a gray color from all the lead and the fuel that settles out of suspension when, we, when the oil has been introduced. Uh, so this is kind of the, the makeup of our report. A lot of people really like the comment section. Normally they're a little bit more useful than this one. I just wanted to show you, I just wanted to show off my engine, to be honest. I just wanted to show you what a good report looks like, because I've got some fun ones here that are not so good. Um, but this is, this is how some stable trends should look. You know, aluminum has fluctuated only a couple parts per million across the whole page. The same for chrome. Iron tends to fluctuate a little bit more just because there's a lot of steel parts in the engine. It accumulates a little faster. It's a little bit more susceptible to things like corrosion or longer oil runs or how hard you're running the engine. So iron tends to fluctuate a little bit more. Um, lead will fluctuate quite a bit just because it accumulates at such a high rate. So if it accumulates at almost 100 parts per million per hour, a couple extra hours on the oil, you're going to see, generally speaking, quite a bit more lead. Yeah. Can you present this or do you present this in a graphical format? This is how we do it. Um, we do have some customers that will take this data and put it in a spreadsheet and then like show the trends over time. Yeah. Um, so we don't do that. This is kind of how we do it. And, and we kind of rely on the comments to, to tell you where things are going up. One of the things that we can do on our end that we can't make a PDF do is we can press a button and look at all these metals in terms of parts per million per hour. Uh, so that's a really good way to compare different oil change intervals. So like a 25 hour and a 50 hour oil change interval. You can normalize them by looking at the parts per million per hour and see if the rate has changed. So that's one of the things we do on our end that we just haven't been able to figure out how to make a PDF do yet. But that's one of the things we do when we, when we work up your report. So back to this. I couldn't get these PDFs to fit in here. See, again, this is not my, this is not my normal thing here um, to, to do this. So I don't know how this stuff works, but I'm trying. Um, okay, so with that, I have some fun reports to go through. So this, so you saw good reports. I'm just gonna pass on the This. Yeah. Sorry, I'm here to lecture to you. Is there a test? Oh, can I take one of those two, I guess? Thank you. Okay.
Yeah, I can share it. <laughs> Oops. Short. Yeah, I can fall. I can look at his so the first one on there is an example from a TSIO 520. So you can see the endotype in the upper left hand corner. It's a TSIO 520. And this guy experienced a problem with an exhaust valve guide that was burned. So if you look at the report, oh, that's tiny. Results right away. Overnight the sample so you get results next day. Otherwise, it kind of goes into the, the next queue. day. That's what I was wondering. The next day after we receive it, yeah. Wow. If you overnight it, that's the secret. If you yeah. need results the next day, overnight it, it comes, you know, a special delivery, and we try to we try to reserve some samples, some space for those samples. And then you're selling yourself short. <laughs> really? Well, thank you, you. you do a great job with Thank you. Well, it's it's easy when you believe in the product. I, I really do think oil analysis tells you a lot about your engine that you wouldn't know about otherwise. So that it's, it's easy when it sells itself. So this, I hope, uh, GSIO 520, if you look at the reading, start back from the report from above. And if you look at nickel, iron, then those three elements start to increase with each oil change. They get higher and higher. And it's, it's not like his oil changes were getting much longer. So he's got 35 hours, 43 hours, 31 hours, and 34. But you can see how much it changed from here to here. And from here to here, it doubled over that interval from a couple of years. These are parts per million. Yes, these are parts per million of microscopic metals. For the same number of hours on the engine. Yeah. For each oil sample. Well, roughly, I mean, 35 hours, 43 hours, 31 hours, and 34 hours. So his oil change intervals have not gotten any longer, for, for all intents and purposes. But to look at a nickel has almost doubled in four oil changes. Um, and so this is what he found. When they bore scope, they found the burned exhaust valve. And if this would have been something, how else would he have found this? If maybe he would have found it at his annual, like they're bore scoping every oil change. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of useful to find it maybe be before your annual, so you can get it done at your annual. Or to know, like he, he had four oil changes worth of notice to know something was going wrong and to start to look into it. And that's the value of the oil analysis, is those trends over time. Amanda, I'm going to interject here. We've got five minutes. I just want to give you the five minute warning. And, okay. then, <laughs> and then we can gather once the meeting's over and people can talk to you individually and ask questions. Okay, so, yeah, that's fine. So I want to talk about um, the last page in your report. This one is cool. But you can look it through the others, you can ask me questions, I can show you pictures. Uh, the last page in your report. So this is the 182 that my flight instructor is a club member in. And he took off from Champaign, Illinois. Uh, he was flying to Ohio. And he started to lose oil pressure. Oil temperature skyrocketed and he diverted to Danville Airport, you know, four miles from where I live, and parked the plane on the on the ramp and there was oil coming out of the cowling. And I saw his post on Facebook and said, Hey, can I go take an oil sample from your engine while it's sitting there? And he goes, Yeah, by all means. So this is the oil that came out of that 182. And this is the piston that came out of that 182. <laughs> So this that. is how detonation looks in oil analysis. 417 parts per million of aluminum wow. when average for that engine is eight. <laughs> Maybe if they would have sampled a little bit sooner, we would have had some indication this is going on. But um, this is just an example of, you know, when a good engine go bad, they, they, they tell you, they tell you stuff uh, before they fail. And I guess 
part of my five minute warning, uh, if, you, if you ever have feedback on your reports, if you ever have feedback on the comments, on anything, you, we are, you have my card, please email me, call me. Um, I'm, I'm just a phone call away. I'm here to answer any questions you have, any comments, any complaints, direct them to somebody else. But I'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oil analysis is $35. Take the kit. I have a ton of kits. They're free. These kits have everything in them that you need to get started if you're not familiar with us. You put your oil in the bottle. Um, let's see, there's an instruction card. There's one of those pieces of paper to fill out from the back. Um, there's some great packaging material, so you wrap this in here, you put it in the bottle, you fill out the paperwork, you put it all back in here, and then you send it in the prepaid mailing envelope. So you don't even have to pay for shipping, uh, all you do is drop it in the mail and get it to us, and we will email your results if you give us your email address or we'll mail them to you. Um, what else? What else? Oh, really quick, my story with my engine, what caused the oil pressure drop? The previous owners left us a present in the form of a piece of paper towel. When they swapped the 0300 for the 0360, they took off the mags and put pieces of paper towel in where the mags should have been. Oh and that God. piece of paper towel made its way down into our engine. And Did it oil pick up? Yep. Oh, boy. I, oh, I don't know if I have pictures. Oh, oh, and one more thing. Okay, okay, okay. I know I have, I have two minutes left. Just because you wanted to see. Just because you wanted to see. This is what our filter analysis looks like. Um, we don't give you the alloy numbers, but what we do is we, we, we lay out the pleats, we measure the pleats, and we quantify the amount of metal. And we do that by testing them with acids. The different metals will react differently to acid, different acids. So we'll identify the metal based on what acid they react to. We'll type up a conclusion paragraph and we'll include pictures of the metals um, and, and the descriptions of their size. So this is what um, filter analysis will look like. Question. Yep. Do we use the same return bottle for oil filter analysis? Ah, uh, you if, if, so what I do, what I do because I live in Illinois and I send my samples, I will take this and I will tape it to the top of a box and I will put my oil sample and my car sample and my filter sample all in the same box and send it. So yes, yeah, so this will work for a box. Just put it, if you have a twin, put two of your samples in the same box and do the same thing. So those two samples arrive together. With the twin, comparing one engine to the other is totally invaluable because they should wear the same. They should act the same. If aluminum goes up on one side, it should go up on the other side if it's operational. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>